Welcome to Morning Devotion with Ken Gurley. Devotions designed to inspire you on your daily walk with God. Here's your host, Ken Gurley. Hey, good morning. Welcome, Allison, April, Jessica. Good to see each and every one of you. Lynn, happy that you're here. Corey, happy that you took the time and made it past made it past the holidays. Here we are in Terrific Tuesday. Terrific Tuesday, yeah. Well, small group-wise, it's called Taco Tuesday. But the day after Cyber Monday, it's called Giving Tuesday. And I, I do want to share something with you really important toward the end. You can see a hint down here at my side with a little Reach Out America button. And uh, if you don't make it to the end of the devotion, please consider, consider ROA uh, on this Giving Tuesday. Very thankful for each of you, all of you. This, Bobby, Vicki, Brenda, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hard to believe, here we are in the last day of November. What a privilege to finish up 11 months with each of you, with all of you. Got a great month ahead to close out the year strong. And uh, we just believe God's going to be with us. God sees the swamp thinking God's thoughts. That's what I want to talk to you about today. And I pray that it's a blessing. I pray that it ministers to you. Okay, the drill. Like, share, follow, subscribe. People are making fun of me for saying that. Maybe I need to get an announcer just to come in and promo that. I don't know. But I'm happy you're here. Uh, share this with others. As with many of his other stories, Hans Christian Andersen sought to impart morals in his classic telling of the ugly duckling. The story begins with the mother duck. You know the story? Discovering this unusually large egg amidst the other eggs in her nest. Eggs hatch. The emerging fowl from the large egg large, ungainly. As the birds grew, the ducklings mock the larger bird, deem it the ugly duckling. Eventually, it's driven away from the shore. And uh, on occasion, on occasion, the large bird would see beautiful birds with long white necks soaring overhead. A yearning, a longing, a wistfulness gripped that bird's soul. I wish I could join them. I wish I could join them, said the ugly duckling. Yeah. You know the story. What a beautiful story it is. A long winter came, long winter passed. Amazingly, somehow the ugly duckling survived alone during that winter and when warmth returned to the world, that bird stretched his wings and realized that there was a power there that heretofore had not been known. Soon the bird began to fly, encircling a lake. The ugly duckling noticed some of those beautiful white birds that he had seen during just prior to winter. The desire for community pushed him to over, overcome his fear of isolation. They may run me off, he thought, but I'm so lonely. And as the lonely bird approached the swans, well, you know the story. It became apparent that he was no ugly duckling at all. It was a case of mistaken identity. Now, that childhood story attempts to teach us that we are often unaware of our true identities, that we go unrecognized and unappreciated by others, that just a little knowledge of who we really are, yeah, yeah, we can refuse the typecast we can refuse efforts to conform us into someone else's mold. Yes, this case of mistaking identity permeates not just ducks and swans, it permeates human beings. It was only when the ugly duckling was confronted with his true image did he realize who he really was. That's a great lesson for kids. Probably a better lesson for teen and young adults. But can I say, those of us who are a little longer in the tooth, <laughs> yeah, that's us. 
but long in the tooth bunch, this is pretty good too. Because we have been taught since childhood the mirror never lies. And we gaze into the mirror and we feel inadequate, unworthy. We stare into the faces of those around us seeking approval and any sign that we're loved. No one taught us that the adequate mirror is God's face. And as we look upon the face of our creator, only then do we realize who we really are and how valued we are. And we see ourselves as his image in this world. And we realize again and again in God, we are loved. The 139th Psalm. Folks, this is it. Buddy, this is it. Charlene, Marvin, this is it. The singer says, I, God, I know your thoughts about me. How precious are your thoughts toward me, Lord. How great is the sum of them. If I could count they are more in number than in the sand. Yes. How does God feel about us? Do you know what you think about yourself? Your interior world affects your exterior world. We probably don't talk about this subject enough, but how we view ourselves, how we think about ourselves, affects who we are, how we live. Others may see the ugly duckling, but God sees the, the swan. And we need to be very careful that we're thinking God's thoughts. Can I get a witness to that? Amen? Zane, that's what I believe with all of my heart. That we need to think God's thoughts about us. If you would, identify yourself, come out from the shadows, leave a prayer request, encourage the family of the Lord that's gathering here. We're going to get through this year strong. We're going to get through it together. The 139th Psalm is God putting his hand on the Bible figuratively and saying, this is how I view you. This is what I think about you. This is how I feel about you. That amazing song forms the catalyst for right thinking within us. The psalmist explores so many thoughts in this 139th Psalm, how God knows us, still loves us, how we can never escape his sight, how he's always got his eye on us. Before our parents saw us, he saw us. Before we were born, he fashioned us. He shaped us. He made us. Before we lived our first day, he charted out the days of our lives. He knows us, and still he loves us. Wonder of wonder. Miracle of the miracle. The psalmist, uh, in, in this 139th psalm, it's just filled with so much affirmation. We are filled with questions, but God wants to give us affirmations. We, 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 we ask ourselves, do, do I really know who I am? Do I grasp uh, what I'm supposed to be doing? Why I'm here? Is my self-worth tied to looking uh, a certain way or accomplishing a certain thing or being a certain person? Is how I feel about myself dependent upon a certain wardrobe, a certain standard of living, an uptown address, or having the right friends. Hey, you got friends in the right places. You're an MD family, 2021. Because we're here to affirm our identity, our worth in God's sight. These are neglected subjects, but wow, are they needed? Are they needful? You, because we fail. We fail to see our worth. Do you remember singing that song? I do. Unworthy, unworthy. I mean, we, we talk about for such a worm as I. <sighs> Drilled into our consciousness is a value, is an idea that we're not valuable. We're not very valuable in God's sight. That we're just refuse. We're on the junk heap of life, a relic. We neglect the concept, the media doesn't. Whitney Houston once sang that the greatest love is learning to love yourself. I, I, I know where she's coming from, but the greatest love really is to love God, Mark 12, 30. The next greatest love is to love others as yourself. But three loves are ranked here. The reciprocal love of God, the love one, love one has for another, but love others as yourself. And I think that's what Whitney Houston was trying to say. Is it's really impossible. It's impossible to love others until you come to grips that God loves you. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves 
the little children. Can you get away from the fact that God really loves you? Yes. Yes. Do you know? Boy, can I just be transparent? Tony, Jonathan, Zane, can I be transparent? Hardest person to get along with is someone who feels inadequate, insecure, inferior. Yes. The world's solution is not good. Focus on loving oneself. No. Loving God first comes. You remember that acronym, joy, Jesus first, others second, yourself third. We usually say that to put God in front of self and put others in front of self. But don't you forget that joy cannot be spelled unless you get the why in the equation. Yes, don't forget about yourself. Don't lose your sense of worth and identity in God. How many prodigals are out there right now because they feel so unworthy? How many people drift away from God because they feel so insecure and inferior? You need to come to grips with what God thinks about you and the high value he places on you. You are his workmanship. You are his, you are his poema. You are his poetry. You are his masterpiece, one translation says. That's how God views you. When God sees you, what does he see? Does he see a wretch undone? No, he sees a swamp. He told Jerusalem, and it was in ruins. Your walls are continually in ruins. You see the ruins. I see what is and what shall be. And Hosea, he called Israel the one I do not love, but then God pivots and says, wait a minute, I still love you. He calls a traitor a friend. He calls a faithless apostle the rock. He calls things that are not as though they are, because that's how God sees through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of his great love. And since God loves us, when he looks at us, he looks at us through those eyes of love. When he looks at us, he looks us at us through the blood-stained cross, through the washing of his blood, through a righteousness that's not our own. We see our filthy garment. He sees robes of pure Right? God sees the swan. We need to learn to think like God thinks. I'm not talking about narcissism, self-love. I'm talking about divine love. He is love. Reading the 139th Psalm, it's all you can conclude. I mean, even a cursory, I'll, I'll just give you a little broad outline. A cursory reading of the first five verses of that Psalm says, God's aware of me. God knows me. He knows my every move. He sees me when I get up in the morning. He knows when I lay down. He knows what I'm about to say. He hems me in on every side. He lays his hands on me. You're not a statistic to God. You're not a number. You're his delight. You're his child. Oh my. He knows us better than we know ourselves. We don't know why we do what we do. But he knows the number of hairs on our heads. He captures our tears. He stores them. He watches over us with eyes of love. Yeah, that's just what the first five verses say. <laughs> oh, my. The next six verses says, Then my God is available to me at all times. There is no place I can run from his spirit. There's no place I can flee from his Present. If I could somehow get on a space plane and ascend into the heavens, if I, if I can get on a deep water submersible and make my, go my, make my bed in the depths of the sea, if I could rise on the wings of morning, if I settle on the far side of the sea everywhere, everywhere. He's not only there, but he's there to guide me. He's available to me. He's accessible to me. Jesus said he would be with us until the end of the world. So for every last day, doomsday prophet, I have the assurance that no matter what God does, for the rest of this month or the next year, he will never leave me, he will never forsake me, and when I'm going through the fieriest of trials like Stephen, Jesus will be standing, oh my, watching my every move, he's there. When I feel good about myself, he's there. When I feel bad about myself, 
when I'm faithful, when I deny him, he's there. When I'm questioning him, when I'm boasting in him, he's there. When I'm fearful, when I'm confident, he is there. He's that fourth man in a fire. Lord, you saw me before I was born. Your, your word says I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are there, God. And God says, God says in Jeremiah, I know the plans I have. Plans for you to prosper. He wants you to have a good December, folks. He wants you to have a good last day of November. He, he wants to give you a hope and a certain future. Those thoughts toward you. The psalmist said, they're so great. They're so precious. More numerous than the individual grains of sand on the seven golden strands of the seven continents. And get this. His way of thinking about me. His way of seeing me as a swan and not an ugly duckling. That thought life. That view, that perspective, that paradigm is available for me. God is there. God is here. He's available to me at all times. And then the next six verses of Psalm 139, he accepts me. God accepts me. Search me, God. Know me. I don't want to think the wrong things. Test me. Try me. Prove me. Look at my anxious thoughts. If there's any way of thinking offensive to you, Lord, Take it from me, because you know me perfectly, and still you accept me. You accepted me when I felt unacceptable. You loved me when I felt unlovable. Yeah. You remember that song? Ah, who was it? Who was it that sang this song? Was it Reef Dottie? If that isn't love, the ocean is dry. No stars in the sky and the sparrow can fly. If that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this. If that isn't love. In, in the closing part of Psalm 139, the psalmist prays the same prayer he did at the beginning. Search my heart, God. Don't let me think the wrong way. God, help me see myself as you see me. Make me into the image that you see. You've accepted. Help me to grow more acceptable in your sight, more like you. See, this is, this is morning devotion, family. This is allowing God's view to become our view, his thoughts to become our thoughts. It's one of the most exciting things about neuroscience now is that you can actually retrain the way you think. Those neural pathways, it's a plasticity. It means it's not permanent. You can get up in the morning saying, I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm no good. Or you can get up in the morning and say, God, you are good, you are good, you are good, and you make all things good. Yes. Rest in him. Paul said, I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Do you get that? There's not a thing in heaven, not a thing in hell that can separate you from God's love. Yes. Nothing that your enemy can scheme against you that will separate you from the faithfulness of God. Meister Eckhart said it like this, to stop God loving me would be to rob God of his Godhead. For God is love no less than he is true. God, yes, he loves you. Tobias, he loves you. Shirley, he loves you. Kirk, Kathy, Edna, he loves you. And that story of the ugly duckling, the story closes with him flying towards swans, swimming in the lake below, and he's gliding to the lake. He sees his reflection was that of a creature he didn't recognize. It startled him. The creature was beautiful. Who was this creature? When he settled into the water, what startled him more was the beautiful bird started swimming toward him, accepting him, friendly, not me. And on the shore, two children were heard to cry, look, there's another one, and it is the most beautiful swan of them all. Just as that swan needed external confirmation of who he was, we require 
We need to turn our eyes on Jesus and seek that look of love. When God thinks of you, you are loved. When God thinks of you, you are the apple of his eye. When God thinks of you, you're worth the blood he shed at Calvary. He sees your struggles. He sees you. He wants to free you from a low opinion of yourself and of your life. He wants to free you to become the person he knows you to be. Allow his spirit to transform you. Allow his spirit to conform you into his image. Oh, praise God. Today's Giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday, and I hope you've enjoyed this today. And let me just mention something. Uh, in the comment section, I put a link to a Facebook uh, Reach Out America thing that Brother Mark Johnson, who's on the board of Facebook, started. Do you know that in 12 months leading up to the general conference in October, Reach Out America processed an immense amount of donated goods needed for desperate situations for victims of storms, fires, earthquakes, water purification systems for Haiti after the earthquake, tarps for roofs, hot meals for people who had no power, generators for those who needed them, fuel for those generators, food, cleaning supplies, baby food, formula, 118 wheeler loads of goods valued at $8 million wholesale. Yeah, yeah. And do you know that in the 12 months, the 12 months, the total cash donation given to ROA to accomplish this $8 million effort was $40,000, largely through a handful of people and churches. So get this, for every $5 given to ROA, $1 thousand dollars of goods were distributed. I can't think of a better return on a gift of a donation that creates outsized impact. And all of these goods were distributed through our UPCI missionaries and churches, church folks, ministering to their communities. I, I want you to consider this is Giving Tuesday. If you have five dollars, it can have a thousand dollar impact just follow the link in the comments. Share this with others. And may God bless you. May God bless you today. Look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. A momentous day tomorrow. And one that I, I know you don't want to miss because I'm going to be dealing with a subject tomorrow that is going to be coming before the Supreme Court. And uh, it is tomorrow's a day to pray, to pray. So don't miss this tomorrow. Share this with others. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of this incredible family. Amen. Thank you for listening to Morning Devotion with Ken Gurley. Join us next time for another inspiring devotion. To support this ministry, please visit firstchurch.com forward slash give.